Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. We have a presentation with Discovery Silver, uh, which trades on the venture under the ticker DSV. Uh, with me, I have Taj Singh, CEO. He's going to go over the updated resource. For anyone that is brand new to the story, I would recommend watching some of the previous uh, webinars on the Adelaide Capital YouTube channel, because this is really going to be about recent news. Um, and yeah, as always, this presentation will contain forward-looking statements. If you'd like to know more about those, you can find them on the company's presentation on their website. And there will be a Q&A section uh, to the session, so feel free to input your Q&A in the box at the bottom. Actually, I think most of the session will be Q&A, so feel free to start putting those in right away. Uh, with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce Taj. Hi, Taj. Hi, Deborah. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. So some exciting news out recently. Yeah, and it was uh, it was long awaited. Um, it's been a, about a couple of years since we acquired the project, and we've been drilling, drilling, drilling all through the pandemic. Um, you know, big acknowledgement to our Mexican team to keep doing that, uh, to keep uh, keep things going and safe for everyone. And uh, yeah, we finally were able to put out this news, and then we've got obviously some very exciting news coming out in about a month's time as well. So uh, exciting times. Great. Well, why don't you give us a little bit of an overview of the updated resource, and then if anyone has any questions, we can start grilling you. Perfect. Fantastic. So I'll uh, yeah, I'll just go over about five, six slides in the resource to give some context because it is is the news we're talking about now. And then yeah, in the Q and A, I can uh, flip to whatever we need to depending on what we're talking about. Looking at our uh, new resource, which was released last week, um, just going to talk about this first slide. It talks about the. The, uh, the inputs and the assumptions that were used in the uh, in the resource and, and really the message we're trying to, to send here is how uh, technically robust and defensible this model really is. So first of all, starting off at our data set, over 500 holes, close to 225,000 meters. So a very, very big data set uh, reporting to the resource database. If you, uh, this is the first time uh, geological and structural constraints were applied to the uh, to the resource model. Previous model was a grade model. So again, that, that obviously uh, increases the rigor of uh, the model. Um, you know, impressively, the waste door ratio is 1.1. So that's, uh, you know, a very favorable char characteristic of Cordero. Uh, starts at surface and it's got a, a very good um, uh, strip ratio um, in the, uh, the resource pit. The resources, this is the first time as well that it was categorized in terms of sulfide and ox oxide and transition. Previously was all assumed uh, as sulfide. Uh, we've done extensive MET testing, um, uh, relogged all the old uh, 292 holes, I think it was, or something like that, to, to kind of, we have a full new interpretation of the geology of this deposit. So it allowed us to categorize, to profile the, to do an oxide profile, a weathering profile, which would include um, the oxides and transitions. So the sulfides are the main driver, we'll talk about it, of, of, of the deposit, but the oxides and transitions have been modeled and what's what's interesting is they actually show a lot of promise uh, to be processed by heat bleaching and, and provide potential early cash flow which I'll, I'll talk about so a uh, very interesting um, new positive uh, add to the Cordero story with that um, if you look at the pit constraint assumptions our commodity prices are shown they're all realistic zincs uh, pretty low compared to what spot is now but uh, you know we tried to keep it realistic here the recovery assumptions were based on 2021 uh, MET program we did. Again, it was very extensive. Uh, the results were released on that in early September. Um, and, and it was a very extensive program we did that was by pit phase, kind of conceptual pit phase based on our new ideas of where the, the pit would be, but also the four rock types in each of those pit phases and composites were made from obviously a variety of samples. So um, you know, speaking as a, as a metallurgist and process engineer, I think the, the, the mat work was really something that might have been overlooked um, by the market. I mean, the, the stock went up a little bit, uh, and then obviously silver came off and, and we got hit. But really, it was a major de-risking item for the project, probably one of the most important over the past couple of years. Uh, and the results were fantastic. We'll talk about those uh, probably in the Q&A, so I won't get into it too much here. The mining cost, we assumed owner mining here. And again, speaking to the, the rigor of the model, we included an escalation factor per bench, which isn't very typical. Uh, but again, we wanted to keep things uh, you know, very, very realistic. And uh, processing costs uh, were supplied by Asenko. Uh, and you'll see here 630 per ton for mill and flotation. And the heat bleaching costs here as well, that, that assumes three-stage crush. 
Um, and the GNA costs, again, were applied by Senko, were supplied by Senko based on their extensive database and obviously our project specifics. And the last point here before I, uh, I, I get into uh, some of the, the numbers is the fact that we use the net smelter return cutoff. Previously, um, Cordero's resource used a silver equivalent cutoff, um, you know, which you'll see in gold deposits and, 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 and single metal deposits, it's typical to use that. For a polymetallic deposit, we really thought uh, a net smelter return was more realistic. It's done by a lot of our peers. Um, and it because it takes into, fact, into account payability, treatment costs, and refining charges. Um, so we, we, we applied that, and you'll see based on the costs I've shown above, the internal cutoff, and that is the cutoff to break even um, uh, for processing and GNA is uh, for the sulfide, it's 725 a ton. So that's the, the sum of the processing costs in GNA. And for oxide, it's 478. So that's the typical industry standard on how to do the internal cutoffs. So that just kind of gives you an idea on things. Now, moving on to the sulfide resource, which again is the, the main part of the resource, the engine room of the economics as well. You'll see we reported a very, very large re resource, um, over a billion ounces, uh, both in measured in measured indicated and inferred um, but really we also showed kind of a the kind of the high grade subset of, of subsets of this so I'll, I'll talk about the high grade sulfide resource here you're talking about close to a billion ounces silver equivalent uh, at about a 46 gram per ton silver equivalent um, grade uh, big positive and was a bit of a surprise for us is the fact that close to 90 percent of even this big resources in the measured and indicated category. But if we move and look at a higher cutoff, uh, look at a $25 per ton cutoff in terms of NSR, you'll see that in this high grade subset, you still have 60% of the contained metal of the whole resource is actually contained within the high grade subset. And that was our thesis when we started this, started our journey on Cordero, that really a, a vast majority of the metal of this deposit is actually in, in a, is a high grade open pit. Um, and you'll see if you even increase it to $25 per ton cutoff, you're talking about over 500 million uh, ounces silver equivalent at a, at a grade of about 101 gram per ton silver equivalent. And so if you, depending on what gold to silver ratio you use, if you use 60 to one, you're talking about, you know, if you looked at it from a gold deposit point, if you use something that's 1.5, 1.6 gram per ton silver equi uh, gold equivalent at, at a very favorable strip ratio, that's that would be considered a high grade gold deposit. So that has to be put into context that that's a, that's a very nice grade for an open pit with low strip ratio. Now looking at growth opportunities, I mean, this is the sulfide resource, it's big. We actually think it can get bigger and, and better um, as we move towards the PFS next year. The opportunities that exist are at the four, far northeast of the deposit, which has had limited drilling, but very encouraging intercepts. So that's for the bulk tonnage. And a part of the story we've talked about is more on the exploration side, but moving more towards, you know, being, being uh, you know, moving maybe onto the next stage of the studies, these high grade veins, which we've been testing, defining the skeleton of them. Um, and we'll continue to do that through, uh, through 2022. Uh, but these high grade veins could potentially be a significant sweetener. They flank the open pit. And, uh, and because all of the capex will be there, these could, uh, you know, especially in the early years, could substantially increase the, the head grades. Uh, going to the mill. We'll talk about that, uh, I'm thinking, in the Q&A. <laughs> Looking at the oxide, again, the oxides only make up about 10% of the entire deposit. So again, uh, sulfides are the key, but the oxides, what's really interesting for us is this was going to be waste or basically stockpile material because it can't be processed favorably um, using flotation. Um, so this is uh, the oxide trans, uh, the oxide transition resource you'll see at the cutoff of 484, you're looking at close to 100 million ounces uh, at a grade of about 22, 23 gram per ton so silver equivalent. Again, vast majority of it in measured and indicated, which is great. Now looking at the higher cutoffs, you see you've got close to, you got over 30 million ounces within this higher grade subset and at a grade of close to 60 gram per ton. So again, translate that into uh, into a gold deposit, you're talking about about a gram per ton or so heap leach uh, would be a gram per ton gold heap leach would be considered high grade. And uh, so this is very much, uh, you know, showing potential for early stage cash flow, which we're very excited about this resource. It's important to know only uh, assumes gold and silver because that's what's recovered in heap leaching. 
Um, and we've done um, MET testing. The MET testing is outlined in the earlier release I talked about from September, which shows very good results at a variety of crush sizes. And we're also now underway uh, completing column testing uh, to confirm that uh, things are looking uh, encouraging there. Just to wrap up, I want to give you some context on the deposits. So this is a plan map. Uh, look, the outline is in black here is the resource pit outline. You'll see the deposit can kind of be separated into the north corridor and the south corridor. And we've always kind of, uh, you know, when we talk about our results, we've always kind of talked about the north corridor and south corridor separated by the Cordero fault, which separates it. And you'll see kind of the main areas of the deposit. Some other main faults are also indicated here, and those were important when we, uh, when we were outlining hard boundaries for our structural domains. Um, but really, what we want to talk about is this, in the next slides, we're going to be showing is long section A to A prime, which is in the north corridor, and B to B prime, which is in the south corridor. Looking at a plan map, you'll see that this is kind of the area uh, which we're going to start at, the Posa de Plata area. They're the highest grades here. Um, over 100 gram per ton uh, for, for several years with the lowest strip ratios. Then you will move to north to the northeast extension. And this is all for the sulfides. And then the third phase of sulfide mining would most likely be in the south corridor. The oxides would start in the south corridor. That's where we're seeing the best grades uh, for the oxides and, and, and the most amount of oxide uh, material. So if we look at this long section again through the north corridor, the blue is outlining the resource pit shell. The, uh, the brown, solid brown indicates the topo and the dashed line indicates uh, kind of the, the weathered material above. And then the, obviously all the sulfides below. But you'll see again, from looking at this long section, very favorable strip ratio. Um, again, very easy to see a nice starter pit here with some very, very juicy grades you can get right at right away. And then that's that Posa de Plata area. Then you step into this Northeast extension and then you start getting you mine some of this material above and then you start getting into some very nice uh, high grade material down here. This blue pit outline is the resource pit outline. I want to make sure it's it's noted. The mine plan will be you know a different than this. It'll be a high grade subset of this blue outline you're seeing. So perhaps you come across here, pull this material, and most likely this material won't even make the mine plan. And that represents a potential growth opportunity as we drill it and or as silver price increases. But I want to note that the, the mine plan is really going to be focused on a, on a nice high grade subset of the total resource that's really going to be trying to optimize uh, financial metrics. If we look at long section B to B prime, that's through the south corridor. Again, you see very favorable strip ratios, but again, you get into this, into this nice juicy stuff after getting some medium grade kind of stuff here. And, uh, and you've got a very nice zone down here you can get into. For the sulfides and for the oxides, you'll see some very good grades up here for the oxides that you get into right away. Uh, so again, very, very favorable geometry from that point of view. So that kind of uh, sums up the, the slides on the uh, resource. So I'll kind of pass it back to you, Deborah, and we can take some Q&A. Thanks for that, Taj. And if anyone from the audience has some questions, feel free to input them. I guess the first question I have is when you first took over the company, the asset, um, you had a few ideas of how you wanted to develop it and what your thesis would be. I know you referenced it earlier, but maybe you could take us through kind of how that thesis is played out and how you hit your objectives with drilling and et cetera with the resource. This project, when we, when we acquired it, uh, the previous operator was Levon Resources. And they were really the kind of concept they had behind this was a very, very large tonnage project um, of lower grade. It's an earth moving operation, definitely makes money in the 20s. Um, if, if silver falls below the 20s, it's, it's challenging. And that's, that's kind of what happened. The project was forgotten. Um, and so we came in and we said, you know, the original discovery days of this deposit, there were some very, very nice grades um, and very broad widths. Um, from the original discovery days of the deposit. So we focused on that Posa de Plata zone I talked about and some of the extensions around it. And we said, even if there's, you've got something here, you've still got a very sizable project with very good, good open pick grades. And you know, if we drill, you know, if we drill, uh, let me just put up, put up this plan map again. The focus was here. There was already very good grades here, but all here was very lightly drilled in the, in the, in the Northeast extension, the South Quarter lightly drilled. And there was some very good smoke there. It just wasn't drilled enough. And again, they were really just 
the previous operators wanted to size. So there was sometimes two, 300 meter spacing between drill holes. And we said, well, this area looks like it, you can hang your hat on it already. There was many, many uh, very wide intercepts over hundred gram per ton silver equivalent. And we thought that if we drill more here, we may get some, you know, we may get uh, the mineralization, the high grade mineralization to extend. And we did, uh, we put almost a hundred thousand meters in it since then. And, and I'd say probably the high grade zone has probably increased in size about four times. Uh, so, so beyond what we really expected. Um, and, and, you know, the model has been tightened up. It's a complete new look at the project. Um, strip ratios have come down, grades have come up. Um, so all of these things are obviously going to favorably have an effect on economics. So really our, our thesis has played out and it's actually gone beyond that. And the fact that the high grade zone has gotten so large. And you've also been chasing down some vein systems. Can you talk a little bit more about those? Yes, definitely. So flanking this kind of high grade pit area, uh, you'll see that there was some high grade veins that were previously drilled before, but they weren't, they weren't kind of tested as veins. They were just included in the pit. Um, and we've been testing them as, as veins and modeling them as veins. And you'll see, we've probably put about 25 to 30 holes, for example, in this Toto Santos vein frame. Uh, stepping out pretty aggressively and hitting every time. And we're getting, you know, grades of, you know, six, 700 gram per ton pretty consistently, sometimes over a kilo, silver equivalent. And, you know, we're getting, I think our average drilled width is about 2.1, 2.2 meters. Um, and we're already, we've already traced this about, we've already tested the drill tested a kilometer and a half, and it's still open along strike. Um, so like our thinking on this is let's, Let's really define the skeleton, skeleton to see how far it goes. But if you can even put four or five million tons of this together uh, and it's grading, you know, uh, 20, 25 ounce per ton silver equivalent, there's some serious, serious uh, high grade ounces you can add to the mine plan. And, and again, the capex, it's essentially starting at surface, these veins. So the underground development capex would be, would be relatively low. And you've already had the capex from the open pit. You would supplement it with underground feed and you'd be able to bring up those margins even further, even if you mine this at 500 ton per day, you're maybe, maybe moving up a little bit higher, it would substantially, because of the, the, the high grades, it would substantially increase the margins. Um, so that's something we're gonna be testing and, and we think it could be a real sweetener to the project. It won't be included in the PA as veins, but potentially in the PFS next year, we'll be able to, uh, we'll be able to, uh, to speak to those uh, in, the, uh, in the mine plant. Okay. And where are you currently drilling? Phase one is completed and all the results went into the updated resource. You're in phase two now. Where are you targeting? The key focus of phase two is obviously uh, infill drilling, taking any inferred uh, into the measured and indicated category. And we were a little surprised uh, of how much is actually in the measured and indicated. And, and to be honest, most of the mine plan is going to be measured and indicated, probably all of it. But that, that was a focus for us. But now we're, there's going to be extensions, like I talked about in the Northeast, where we might be able to open up the pit and extend the pit here. And then we'll be working, obviously, on the veins. Those are the two key focus parts of our approach. And then obviously, regionally on our land package, uh, maybe I can just quickly go to that. But you'll see, you'll see here's the kind of main resource area. There's already been several uh, interpreted intrusive centers identified here. So we're going to be, we've already got reconnaissance teams doing quite a bit of work. And we think we're probably in a position to have three or four new targets to be drilled um, uh, for next year. So that's that's earlier stage stuff, but obviously we we believe this is a district and we think we, you know, the probability of finding another deposit could be high. Well, that's interesting. When was the last time you did pure exploration on the property? We've started pretty heavily in 2021 doing uh, mapping and sampling. Uh, quite, a, quite a few areas have been, have, we've done, we've we mapped and sampled, but in 20, late 2020, early 2021, for the first time, uh, Airborne Mag and EM was flown over the property, which has helped a lot. Uh, quite a bit of, um, we've, did, we've done quite a bit of work on, uh, on looking at alteration, uh, footprints, et cetera, and kind of layering all the various types of information on, tops, on top of each other to really uh, focus in on the key, uh, key targets. Um, so, we're, we're, we were really focused on, on the resource and the Cordero main area, if you will, but uh, we're definitely gonna start looking at some, some potential for some new discoveries property-wide. 
Okay, and maybe you can walk us through updated timelines for the PEA for the feasibility study and kind of what the news flow will look like over the next six months to a year. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, perfect. I got this catalyst slide up. Might as well put it up. So our resource drilling obviously finished at the end of Q2. That's what fed into the new resource as well as the MET testing, which we talked about. So it's both fed into the new resource here. The, the revamp PA is scheduled for late November-ish, mid to late November. And, um, and then the phase two drilling continued seamlessly as soon as phase one drilling ended. Again, the focus is on PFS and the veins. And then I talked about property-wide drilling in Q1. So there'll be a steady stream. Obviously, the major new catalyst coming will be the PEA, um, but drill results will continue to flow probably every month, every three to four weeks uh, from our phase two drilling. Uh, and then hopefully in early 22, uh, we'll, be, we'll be starting to talk about some new targets on the property. Um, yeah, and then we'll continue to de-risk um, with more MET work for phase two, uh, geotech work, et cetera. That, those are all incremental kind of advancements in the project. We'll be obviously um, press releasing those through through 22 as well. And so you intend on doing a pre-phase or going straight to feasibility? I think this is something that we've discussed in the past. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, <laughs> the engineer in me always says, don't miss a study. You got to do your PEA and your PFS and your FS because the jump from PEA to FS is, is, is pretty substantial in terms of de-risking. But I will say, really, the project that's that's coming out Cordero as a PEA is really in most aspects a PFS. Um, like for the fact that ninety percent of the entire resource is measured and indicated. The fact that the entire mine plan is measured and indicated. Um, you know, this really is a PFS. So there's there's some discussion as to whether maybe we move to an FS right away, or we just, you know, within within say less than a year we put a PFS out. Uh, we can accept, you can we can move move to that quite quickly. Um, you know, these are all 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 uh, discussions we've been having internally and thinking about it. Most likely, we will be putting out a PFS, kind of halfway through 22, and then start moving swiftly towards an FS. Okay, and since we're on the timeline slide, for anyone that's somewhat new to junior mining uh, exploration development, maybe you can give us a bit of a timeline of assuming that all the studies uh, are positive and you continue to progress. Um, like, what would be a timeline towards construction and production? Yeah, very high level. If if the PFS comes out, say next summer, uh, you could probably uh, we could probably have an FS slash construction decision by mid twenty three, third quarter twenty three. Uh, start construction at that time, and then probably a year to year and a half after uh, you'd have production. So late 24, maybe 25 uh, is when you could have production. Now, if if things really started moving, silver price environment got, <laughs> got really hot, we probably could accelerate that. We've got a very healthy cash balance of, of, of over $75 million. Um, so we we really could accelerate that uh, by maybe a few quarters, but uh, that's the high level kind of timeline. And uh, I have an audience question, which is what is the minimum silver price needed for this resource to be profitable? Well, th that kind of, uh, <laughs> that's why we've showed these cutoffs. So basically, basically, if you look at this kind of resource at 725, you'd probably need kind of high 20 silver for this whole thing to be economic, realistically. Um, if you did your, your, your math and where it looked at this $25 subset, it'd probably be less than seven, maybe close to $15 for this to be profitable, maybe even less. So that's, I think, gonna be surprising for most people if they actually worked out the numbers and, and, and applied some cost, they'd realize that this high grade subset, actually the legacy perception of Cordero is that it doesn't work at lower silver prices. I think that's gonna be completely thrown out the window uh, pretty soon. And we've been pointing to that. So uh, I think this resource, um kind of shows that well i agree that you're definitely starting to get a lot of attention and recognition and i think that'll continue when you come out with the pea i think this is a good time to talk about my favorite slide which is your scalability one maybe you can walk us through a little bit of the dynamics of that yeah i know this is a, this is an interesting slide especially for uh for the silver bulls out there but uh i, I kind of touched on it just now but this kind of really shows the torque and the leverage we've got as, as silver price goes up. You've got your silver equivalent ounces here um, in all categories on the, 
on the y-axis and on the x-axis, you've got your, your NSR cutoffs. You'll see at $25 per ton, that's that very high grade subset that again could work at very low silver prices. You've got you know over 500 million ounces total. Um, then you move, as you move to $15 per ton silver, you know, silver goes up in price. Now $15 per ton silver um, works. Maybe that's mid 20s and a high 20s. So all of a sudden you've added 140 million ounces. That's already there, drilled off. Most of it in the measured and indicated category. You add 140 million ounces. Silver makes another run into the 30s. You added another 150 million ounces already drilled off. Um, and then as you start moving to the 30s, perhaps, like I said, you add another 110 million ounces. So it's very substantial. Um, the kind of scalability we get, if you look at a typical silver mine, they're typically underground. This doesn't change regardless of cutoff. And the fact that we've got a high grade core, if you will, it's, it's very sizable. So it's a little bit calling it a core, it might be cutting, a, cutting it short, but it's a high grade core with a medium grade halo and a lower grade halo. We're in a very favorable position to continue uh, to make this project larger and larger. And uh, if silver price goes up, or even as CapEx is paid off, this project can get substantially uh, larger. And that's, I think, very unique in the silver space. And this is only, by the way, I wanted to note the sulfide resource. When you add oxides, oxides also go up there. They're not as large, but if you increase uh, your cutoff from 15 to, if you lower it from 15 to, to $5 per ton, you get an extra, you know, 100 million ounces of equivalent. So, I mean, goes to 100 million ounces. So. Um, yeah, that's, that's really what it's, what it's trying to show, uh, the cutoff. When you can bring the cutoff down with silver price going up, you really add a lot of inventory. Great. And when talking about size, I mean, that's one of the most appealing things in this company is just a massive project. Can you put that into context for anyone that may be new to the story? I think a lot of people are familiar with looking at gold, not silver, and yeah, maybe you can just frame it in terms of where it sits and like versus other assets or maybe versus gold companies yeah so we're to put it in context and we, we put this in the press release and we've always talked about it our numbers kind of 15 and 15 we want to have at least 15 years of mine life and, and target production at least 15 million ounces of silver equivalent a year with cash costs in the lowest half of the industry cost curve whether it's you know 10 11 12 dollars cash cost maybe aic of of 13, 14, that's kind of what our targets are internally. We've talked about that. So at 15 million, and remember, that's only the high grade subset I'm talking about. That's not, that's not the big project. That's not the big mega resource you saw. That's just the high grade project that we're focusing on now. If even with that, at 15 million ounces of silver equivalent, uh, we would be probably number six or number seven in terms of the largest primary silver mines in the world. When we expand that, because there'll be some years where we're well over 20 million ounces of silver equivalent, and we go to 40,000 ton per day, which I can talk about in a second, we'd be in the kind of 25 million ounce per silver equivalent range. We'd be probably top two or three primary silver mine in the world. Um, and to put it into context, um, some of the larger silver producers produce about 25 million ounces, 30 million ounces a year total across five, six mines. So this is all coming from one mine. Um, so again, it, it really speaks to the, to the size here. And again, all at a, at a pretty digestible capex. Well, looking forward to seeing some of those numbers uh, in the PEA, which you said is going to be out towards the end of November. Correct. Yeah. And maybe, maybe Deb, if I could mention one thing, you would ask the question of our approach versus, sure. versus the previous operators. This slide kind of sums it up. They really had a, had a bigger, better approach, which I talked about. They were trying to make kind of a penasquito analog. Um, it actually has a lot of similarities to Penasquito in terms of uh, deposit type, mineralogy, precious metal content. Similar, they have more gold, they have more silver. But if you look at the total value, it's pretty similar. Base metal content similar, and obviously that was sold for for billions of dollars. So that was kind of how the previous operators, their analogy, um, kind of what they were going for. Uh, they had again big throughput, cutoff very low cutoff grade. I'd say that this twenty gram per ton silver equivalent cutoff grade kind of roughly lines up with an NSR cutoff grade of, of say the seven, um, the kind of our base case, or maybe a little higher, maybe 10. But again, for that, you need a huge throughput. CapEx is pretty high here, sitting at about close to $600 million. For us, it's a disciplined approach, head grades I talked about, 
especially early in the mine life, looking at 100 gram per ton silver equivalent, high grade zones early in the mine life, uh, really focus on that. Um, and again, now you've doubled, tripled the head grade. You don't need a 40,000 ton per day mill straight away. You start at 15, 20,000 ton per day. Then once you've paid your capex off, you can expand to the 30, 40,000 ton per day. Um, so that's that's our general thought. And 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 capex have, you know, I spoke about it before, but we're we're targeting, um, you know, hopefully for the sulfide portion of it to be around 350 to 400, and the heat bleach part of it to be around 50. So I think, again, a very digestible kind of capex uh, up front. Right. Well, I don't have any other questions. I don't see any from the audience. Taj, is there anything else that you wanted to discuss today in regards to the net results of the updated resource? No, I think uh, I think that's it. And again, if there's if anyone has any questions down the road, please again feel free to reach out. Um, all of our all of our socials are up on our, our website, and, and uh, you can contact us uh, through that or through uh, through emails through Adelaide. But thank you very much for having us. Yeah, thanks for uh, going over the updated resource. Congrats, looks good, and yeah, looking forward to seeing some more news flow. So thanks for presenting, Taj. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, and yeah, have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye.